I'm gonna start sharing my screen then. <clears throat> All right. So we're gonna talk today about parasophageal hernias and we're gonna try to review some of the uh, uh, key data. I, I, I don't intend this to be a very comprehensive and in-depth thing, but, but I think we're, we're gonna clarify some, some key concepts. Uh, all right, Jordan, before you go, and then somebody else will pick it up for you. So a 70-year-old female patient presents to your clinic with a history of reflux, postprandial chest discomfort, and occasional regurgitation. Her PCP did not get any workup. She just said, go see Dr. Bloom, and um, she's in your office. So how do you assess this patient? Anything in the history or physical examination specifically that you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, I think the history is critically important in these patients, and so I would start with a really comprehensive uh, history about her reflux, how long she had it, what does she use to treat it, is she on medications? Uh, I would want to know more about the heartburn, um, does it happen in different times of the day? Is it, is it only postprandial? Does she experience it supine or prone? Um, you know, uh, I would ask her some questions about her eating habits, if she goes to bed right after she eats or if she's sort of weights, um, the occasional regurgitation, you know, and then, and then I would obviously want to know a history of any, a, a past medical history. Um, is she diabetic? Does she have any autoimmune diseases? Um, you know, a, a comprehensive uh, past medical and past surgical history. Also, see if she's ever had any trauma uh, or why, why uh, trauma? What's that? Why trauma? Well, because the title of this uh, talk is is a diaphragm. Yeah, no, no, I'm just, I'm just, I just want you to verbalize it. Okay, so I mean, patients who've had trauma can have undetected. Uh, diaphragmatic injuries. That Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So early satiety as well. Uh, if they avoid to eat late at night, if they have any dysphagia, shortness of breath, um, and, and personal history of malignancy. And then an exam, uh, I guess you want to look for any indirect signs of anemia. If they, have, if they look like they've been losing weight recently, uh, if you hear any uh, bowel sounds in the chest, and then just a, a basic abdominal exam, I guess. So with that presentation, what is your differential diagnosis? I know it's pretty broad, but just to say it out loud. Yeah, I mean, esophageal, <clears throat> a motility disorder uh, in the esophagus, uh, you know, th this could be just run-of-the-mill reflux disease, and this could potentially have progressed to something with esophagitis, a Barrett's type thing, suggesting the, the discomfort. I mean, this could be cancer in a 70-year-old. Right. Uh, this could obviously be a parasophageal hernia. Um, Perfect. I think you hit on the major ones. Uh, epiphrenic diverticula as well, although those are rare. And then never forget about malignancy, of course. So how do you work out this problem just initially? Yeah. <clears throat> so you said I already did a physical exam. I would get a baseline set of labs, uh, as you what, said. What are you looking for in the labs? So looking for anemia, um, possibly um, microcytosis, uh, low MCV, mm -hmm. suggesting that... Sure that uh, this is an iron deficiency or an anemia of chronic disease type of situation. Um, I would, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't see a role for too many other labs. I mean, you could think about H. pylori testing, uh, mm -hmm. serologic testing. Um, but I think the, the, the real key to this patient is going to be both um, some sort of contrast swallow study and, and possibly an EGD. Okay. So let's say that you got the, this x-ray. Yeah, and a chest x-ray, thank you. What, um, what do you see? So here you, you see an air fluid level retrocardiac above the diaphragm, um, uh, suggesting that there's a bowel or stomach or something herniated above the diaphragm. Okay. What, uh, what's the value of the lateral? Uh, trying to sort out one other thing that that picture sh could show. Um, well, the lateral would could give you an idea if that's an, an anterior or posterior defect, which could help you uh, classify the defect. Yeah. So, so if it's anterior, what was that? What would that be? Oh, I knew this when I took the T site a few weeks ago, and now I forgot. <laughs> uh, Begins with an M. More Gagney. Thank you, uh, Dr. Allen. Exactly. Exactly. All right, so Jordan, you get that swallow that you see on the right side. Just briefly describe the findings and what's the diagnosis. Yeah, so the swallow on the right side shows that uh, the stomach is herniated up into the chest. 
uh, the GE Junction, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell whether or not the GE Junction is, is herniated up into the chest uh, or not. So I, I, I... If you had to say what type of parasophageal hernia that is, just with that picture, I know it's hard with just one picture, what would you say that is? Yeah, I, probably a type one because it's the most common. So let's go over the types of parasophageal hernias. Do you remember them? Yeah. So you have a type one, which is a sliding hiatal hernia. Um, and, you know, to me in that photo, it looked like the GE junction may still be, uh, at, you know, at, a, at the diaphragm. So, um, so pretty much we define them based on the location of the GE junction and the rest of the stomach. So the type one is just that the GE junction is above the diaphragm. Okay. Type two, the G junctions at the normal position, but then the fundus herniates. Yeah. Uh, so people say that these are very rare, just the pure type twos. Yeah. And I guess the bulk of the ones that we see are the type threes where both the G junction and the fundus of the stomach go up. So if I had to say, I think most of the stomach here is up. And if you had to guess, I think type three would be, would be a good guess. Type four is where you have other organs involved there, most commonly the uh, transverse colon, just because it's attached to the rear curvature of the stomach, gets up there, sometimes the spleen, sometimes the pancreas, small bowel, uh, more rarely. And then just uh, a quick uh, review of the type of uh, rotation that the stomach can have, the organoaxial, where pretty much it just upside down, the rear curvature just flips over the other side, and then the mesenteroaxial, where the pylorus area kind of goes up along that, that plane that we see there. Luis, uh, does that yeah. make a difference to you, the organoaxial volubilis versus mesenteroaxial volubilis? Would it make an actual difference for management? Uh, yeah. I, I do not think so. I know that some people attempt endoscopic reductions of these uh, hernias in the acute setting, and I don't know if that has anything to do, but to be honest with you, I don't know of any actual clinical implication of this. I, I can't say I've ever made a decision based on yeah. what the radiologist told yeah. me and thought the type of ovulus right. was. This is more for the T side. Jordan wants those 50 bucks next year, so... Uh, so Jordan, the medical student who's helping in clinic asks if uh, it's necessary to obtain a manometry or pH study in this patient as part of the workup. How do you respond? Uh, you know, I, I think that those are both studies that could add value and that are sometimes considered. Uh, what I think about, about tests is, you know, I would only get a test if it's going to change what I'm going to do. And if you have a patient, the indication to operate on a patient with a parasophageal uh, hernia is symptoms, considering that, you know, the patient has had optimal medical therapy and the patient's a reasonable operative candidate. So I'm not sure that they are critically necessary tests uh, in a patient who's symptomatic. I would disagree with that statement, uh, Jordan, because it, is, it may influence the operation you're going to do, whether or not you're going to do a wrap uh, once you re reduce the hernia. So you're going to want to know the manometry to know what type of wrap you're going to be able to do. Yeah, I mean, John, I, I'm not saying I'm right, but I would push back on that a little and say that if a patient doesn't have dysphagia and I do a parasophageal hernia repair, I'm going to do a wrap. Um, and if the patient does have dysphagia, then I would not do a full wrap. I'm not sure that manometry would make that decision for me. I, I mean, again, I could be completely wrong. How Any accurate do you think manometry is with a large parasophageal hernia? Yeah, it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I stand corrected. Can, can you make assumptions about the manometry and prolonged if you know that this patient by past x rays had maybe five or six years of parasophageal hernia? Can you make assumptions about the, the manometry? But basically, we don't restrict it. Have you done this with the chest tubes where you use the same stitch through the skin? Ali, can you mute your uh, microphone? Oh, sorry. Can you I make think, assumptions about the on the board, material? however, on the board, however, I think you're fine to say that you would get a manometry because you want to look at that, or you have to kind of say, you know, I know sometimes you get a manometry, but it's not very accurate in a large hernia like this, and if they don't have this, but you should address it, what your thoughts are, <clears throat> not just skip past it, because then they'll think you didn't think about it, okay? Right. So the I other thing is, do you need a pH study on, on someone? Is it going to change your management? I, 
I think the pH study would not change my management if I was planning to operate on this patient. I mean, the pH study's value would be if this was an, if you're considering non-operative therapy and you wanted to, you know, potentially, you know, you did a scope and there was, there was early esophagitis or something or Barrett's, you know, I mean, then I feel like the medical docs always get the pH studies, but if you're going to operate on the patient, I don't see why that would add value. So a lot of times with these large parasophageal hernias, especially if you have a volvulus component, so their history will be that they've had long-term reflux, but then the reflux got better and then they had worsening either epigastric pain, postprandial symptoms, um, and more obstructive <laughs> symptoms. So they actually kind of, their reflux goes away a bit, just as all based on clinical symptoms. Um, because of the obstructive component of the parasophageal hernia. I think that this doesn't, if you're dealing with a large parasophageal hernia, doesn't add value and just delays treatment. Okay. I got to run down the OR and huddle, but I'll be back in 10 minutes. Sounds good. Who's going to take over for Dr. Bloom? Is there e easy cases? I'll, I'll help out. I can do it. Oh, hey, Mike. Yeah. How you feeling, man? I'm uh, just a little anxious, but we'll see. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sounds good. So, Mike, so we discussed a 70-year-old uh, female that came in with some uh, chest discomfort, regurgitation, and reflux. And uh, we got a swallow that shows a, likely a type 3 parasophageal hernia. We were just discussing the uh, um, need and use of manometry and pH study in yeah. these patients. So, with uh, Michael, congratulations on doing so well in the in-service. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Matista. Yeah, I thought maybe they'd give you the day off here and just say you know all this stuff already, but uh, <laughs> glad to see you're always here for more learning. Oh yeah, absolutely. We, there's always room for improvement. All right, Mike, so what is the treatment plan on a patient where we have a swallow that shows a type three parasophageal hernia and is symptomatic? So my, my treatment plan <laughs> would be a surgical intervention. Um, um, it would be a laparoscopic parasophageal hernia repair, um, uh, EGD and laparoscopic parasophageal okay. hernia repair. All right. just, just hold it right there. So how do you determine surgical candidacy? Um, so I, I probably missed the initial history, um, but- it, No, just, it, just in general, parasophageal hernia, how do you determine who gets surgery, who doesn't? So symptoms is the main drive-in. Um, okay. The, the main drive-in um, uh, indication. And um, you also have to weigh the, the risk and benefits based on age and and um, prohibitive risk factors. Of course. All right, so these are rapid fire, Mike, yes or no? So would you offer surgery to a 65-year-old female with symptoms? Yes. What about an 82-year-old male with symptoms? Yes. What about a 65-year-old male without symptoms? No. What about an 82-year-old female without symptoms? Absolutely, no, not. Do you know any data to support that? Um, I don't know the, the, the details of the data, That's fine. but um, there is a paper that has described um, the, 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 the outcomes of operating for symptomatic versus asymptomatic parasophageal hernia. Right. That's fine. So here is a highly cited paper where we see some familiar names on the authors that uh, pretty much what they did, uh, this is published in 2002, they did a Monte Carlo analytic model to try to determine whether uh, watchful waiting or elective laparoscopic repair was the way to go in asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic parasophageal hernias. This is kind of the outline of the uh, decision tree that they uh, came up with. Uh, they gather all the data to input into that, that model from previously published studies, and also they queried the national inpatient sample just to get new um, data on the outcomes. <clears throat> and then they run a simulation with uh, 5 million patients based on what they describe in the paper. So a uh, couple key things that they found. Number one, progression of symptoms uh, uh, to become significant was about 14% per year. But acute symptoms that developed that require acute uh, uh, emergency surgery was only 1.1% per year. Uh, and that was, that's, a, that's a key number to, to keep in the back of our minds. In terms of mortality of undergoing emergency surgery for a parasophageal hernia uh, from the national inpatient sample was only about 5%, which uh, was shocking based on the data that had been historically quoted 
that put that mortality around 40 or 50 percent on previous uh, single institutional series. And then the hernia recurrence rate was about 1.9 percent per year based on what they estimated, the best estimate based on published series. So I think the key figure is this one where uh, using life tables, they came up with the lifetime risk of developing acute symptoms requiring emergency surgery if you're 65 years old or older. And as you can see, if you're 65 years old, is 18% lifetime risk of needing emergency surgery and that decreases with age um, as expected given a decreasing life expectancy. Uh, but with that, they said with a, for a 65 year old with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic perisophageal hernia, watchful waiting would be better in about four out of five patients. And for an 85 year old, the, the watchful waiting would be better in about nine out of 10 patients and the lab repair only better in about one of every uh, 10 patients. So with that, they say that watchful waiting is a reasonable alternative for the initial management of patients with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic parasophageal hernias. And even if an emergency operation is required, the burden of, of the procedure is not as severe as thought in the past. This is a paper that we need to know. It's usually quoted um, and cited just uh, uh, in, in, in this topic. There's also another um, article that came out in the last mm -hmm. couple of years, and I yep. thought it was in Annals of Thoracic Surgery, um, discussing the risk of octogenarians ha undergoing emergent repair of mm -hmm. a parasophageal hernia. And the mortality of emergent versus elective in that population was much higher. Okay. Um, so that's just something to make sure that you know. I can try to find that article for you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Schumacher. And then you also have to pay attention really to the symptoms because patients have symptoms, they just don't realize it. They change their meal size, they d interpret symptoms differently than you when you say pain. They may, oh yeah, a little bit of indigestion. The more you ask, the more symptoms you get. So you have to uh, really drill a little bit into this and get an idea of, and sometimes they forget that they had this bad episode of pain, but if you go after that, they may tell you about it. So um, it's also, it depends on you, how you get your history. Exactly. And, and they may be thinking indigestion is something different than, you know, postprandial pain or, you know, chest pain that you get after eating, those kinds of things. So, and then anemia is a very common one that's all overlooked a lot of times. It's a lot of patients have significant anemia with this. I, th I think a very small point is that uh, if you decide to watch, that the patients need to be educated along with their family. You know, what to look for, what the symptoms are like, what you can do to avoid the problem. Uh, I always told people, no carbonated beverages, don't overeat, uh, sit upright after you have a meal. And at the first sign of a problem, you need to immediately get somewhere so somebody can evaluate you. And there was a time, I wanna say it was a couple of years ago, I don't know if Chris is on the call, one of the summer students was going to look into all these people who come in emergently or, you know, require surgery and what the outcome was. And I, I know that they found about 20 or so patients, maybe 25. I don't know if it went anywhere. Uh, there was quite a run there for a while where we had these people who came in with incarcerated parasophageal hernias. And uh, uh, again, it's just a, a, an anecdote of one group's experience, but uh, I, I thought it would, was valuable. So would you say that the way you balance between the two papers is the concept of you have to really make sure they're asymptomatic more so than just by age or anything else? Yeah, I, I must admit, I always thought whenever you saw a patient who comes in who has a strangulated hernia, and uh, what their risks are. Uh, I, w I was a little more aggressive about repairing them uh, than watching them uh, because maybe the only ones I could remember the ones who did poorly. So uh, I think I it's agree. a individual thing and you, you, know, you do have to kind of uh, weigh all of those things together. It was, wasn't that long ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago that people thought everybody ought to have this uh, repaired, this condition repaired. So the, the thinking has evolved. Uh, uh, and I think uh, right now, probably knowing both sides of the argument, individualizing it to, to the patient, uh, and as Henning said, carefully talking to them about their symptoms and then warning them about what to look for. 
All right, thank you for the discussion. That was great. Uh, so Mike, you decided to go ahead with surgery. What are your options and can you describe your approach? So, Luis, before you get to that, uh, what if the person comes in and is terribly symptomatic down in the emergency ward, uh, Michael, and you've made the assessment that they have a strangulated hernia and you're in the emergency ward, what, what can you do? What are the options there? Um, so again, I, I will assess their, their, their risk to preoperative risk and age, um, either go to the operator room for, um, in that case, I would, I would be inclined to do an open um, yeah. operation. So uh, is there, is if, there if, I, if I, if I can interrupt there, I have that a little later, Dr. Oh, okay. if you don't mind, right. Maybe if you don't mind, should... sorry, I don't mean to, uh, sure. to interrupt that, but. Yeah, stand down, Doug. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got okay. it. So, All right, so, Mike. So options. Yeah. So I I I I mentioned I'll do a laparoscopic um, parasophageal hernia repair. Uh, my options would be to either do it with a wrap or um, without a wrap, just pexy it. Um, in this case, I would be um, inclined to do a partial wrap, uh, parasophageal hernia repair, partial wrap. Uh, I'll have about a total of five ports: two in the right upper quadrant, two in the left upper quadrant, one just between the um, umbilicus and the xiphoid. Um, start by incising the pars flaccida and uh, mobilize the, um, the, the stomach or the, the stomach from the right cruise and um, get into the hernia sac and mobilize the hernia sac, excise the hernia sac and um, uh, further mobilize the stomach by dividing the short gastric and reduce the hernia and <coughs> assess the size of the defect and either close that either primarily with non-absorber sutures or with a mesh if it's a large defect and perform my wrap. Perfect, Mike. I'm going to stop you there. So just in general, we have a laparoscopic option. We have an open transabdominal option. We have an open transthoracic option. And some people have described a minimally invasive transthoracic option that has really not gone too far. So just very quickly so that we know outcomes. Oh, so these are the principles of surgery. So reduction of the hernia contents. Also thoracal abdominal. That, that's absolutely right, John. You're right. Um, removal of the hernia sac from the chest, assessment of the esophageal length, cruel closure, and then fixation of the stomach within the abdomen, which usually just involves a, either a pexia or a fundoplication. So just very quickly, this uh, paper from 2010 from the Pittsburgh group, they reported 662 patients that underwent um, a laparoscopic parasophageal hernia repair. Most of them were elective. Uh, emergency surgeries were excluded. They reported on 16% urgent surgeries. Those were patients that came into the ED symptomatic, but they were able to be stabilized, uh, and then they got operated under the same admission. One uh, interesting thing to see is that overall, they use esophageal lengthening procedures quite a bit, but that decreased with uh, time and experience. Uh, the about 13% used mesh reinforcement and then conversion to open was rare in those experienced hands, about 1.5%. Leak rate, 2.5%, probably related to the amount of uh, um, esophageal lengthening procedures that they did. Periop hernia recurrence, this is days after surgery, only 0.8% and mortality 1.7%. Um, and then radiographic recurrence was fairly common at almost a two-year follow-up, about 15%. But those patients with symptoms and radiographic recurrence that required reoperation was only 3%. So I think it's good to have uh, some of these figures in our mind just as a benchmark of uh, what the outcomes uh, should look like. In terms of thoracic repairs, <clears throat> this study from Michigan in 2004 reported on 240 patients undergoing transthoracic repair, most of them elective. Uh, they almost routinely did lengthening procedures and the fund application was innocent. They did not do BELCs. Uh, and then in terms of results, as you can see, leak rate was 0.8%, pretty low, uh, hernia recurrence 1.7%, mortality 1.7%. Um, of course, they don't comment on chronic pain and other issues related to thoracotomy. Lastly, this one from, uh, I mean, Mayo Clinic has uh, <clears throat> multiple large series on belt safe fund applications, but this is a more recent paper in JCTBS uh, where they reported 118 patients having a BELC Mark IV 
and they match that one-to-one -to, -one to lab instance. So we can see here the ridiculous volume of patients that the Mayo Clinic has with over 1,100 pairs of agile hernias over 10 years. And then uh, the lab nieces and the belsies, they were matched on age, gender, and date. And they came out with two groups of 118. And then this is what they found. Uh, recurrence rates were not statistically different, but the belsies were about <coughs> half of that. Uh, leak rates were zero in the belsies and about 7% nissens, and that was statistically significant. And that led to a higher rate of reoperation in the lab nissens. Uh, and then uh, follow up at 10 years, um, it was better in terms of recurrence, it was better with the Belsis. Now, the caveat is that there's a huge selection bias with this paper. 94% of the Belsis were done by only one surgeon, Dr. Allen, and uh, pretty much we're comparing here outcomes of one surgeon uh, against the rest. So just uh, take that literature with uh, grains. Uh, for the residents, look up these two papers uh, by Alan and by Dr. Cook from UC Davis on how to do a Belsey mark fund application. Uh, you might get asked uh, about the key aspects of those. And Luis, wasn't Mark Allen's cases all transthoracic? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. All right, Mike, so you decided to perform a lab repair. You mobilized the esophagus. You determined that the esophagus should be lengthened. How do you determine this and what are your options? So uh, I will um, ensure that I've dissected off the gas, the G junction fat pad to identify where the G junction should be. If it's less than uh, 2.5, 2 to, <coughs> 2 to 2.5, uh, 2.5 to 3 centimeters um, from the, the, from the uh, cruise, then I would perform a lengthening procedure. Uh, I would do a college gastrovasely, which is a wedge fundectomy, and to, to get a more length. Okay, so, sorry. So here I have a, I have a cartoon. The actual call is- but uh, Can I interject one yes, thing, Mike, please. that you wanna make sure that you say is that you wanna say it's tension-free. Tension so if you're pulling on it, you know, you can have intra-abdominal esophageal length. Yeah. And so you wanna just add that phrase. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. So for esophageal lengthening, the actual call is, is division just to get more length of, um, of esophagus, if you will. There's a modified colitis gastroplasty that was described both open and laparoscopically where they use an EA stapler to create a window and then divide that part of the fundus to get the lengthening. And I would say, and I would like the attendings to comment, uh, that most people now probably do this wedge gastroplasty just to obtain the same result. So, so while we are discussing, I have this quick video here where they determine that the esophagus is short and they're just demonstrating a wedge gastroplasty just for the residents so that we can see how it's done, at least in this video. Does everybody do wedge gastroplasty? Is that pretty much? Yes, I think, you know, training at, at UPMC with Lukatich, they got away from doing the, your uh, figure B. Right. <laughs> okay. And he used to believe that every single uh, parasophageal needed a colis, but then got away from that as well. And I think that okay. you showed that in your paper. On the paper, right. Yeah. And is B associated with more leaks than others? That I don't know, Dr. Lennon. I don't know that yeah. either. I just only I say that because you're crossing a staple line with a staple. Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I just think, you know, the wedge gastroplasty, I think, is it just technically a little bit well, we're really, not cumbersome. What we really call the call is gastroplasty is not what we do what we in the, at this, like these days. When we say call is gastroplasty, it's really, we're doing really a wedge gastroplasty. Right, I mean, I, what size dilator is in the office? That's an excellent point, Dr. Geiser. So always have a bougie there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And, and it also matters what size it is. At least if you use an incomplete fundal plication, and you then, so the history is of who, who did this first this combination of gastroplasty and, and fundal plication. And the first one was Griffith Pearson in Toronto. And he used a Balsy fundal plication and the combination with Collis mm -hmm. gastroplasty. And he used a 48 French dilator to construct the gastroplasty. And then Mark Oringer observed that operation, went home and used a 52 or 54 French dilator and got complete um, reflux every single time he operated. Hmm. It's like six or 10 patients. 
And then he, for that reason, he introduced the collis nissen fundoplication. So the collis nissen fundoplication is uh, a result of having misunderstood the collis belsi fundoplication. But that's just for historical purposes. Thank you, Dr. Geisman. All right, Mike, you get enough, enough length and then proceed to close the hiatus, but you notice that the defect is large and you're having trouble closing it. Just tell Can me. Can I make one more comment? Yes, please. On just the uh, lengthening procedure. So yeah. you have to be careful because you're taking now a portion, you're creating a neoesophagus from the stomach and tubularizing the stomach. And this, that portion of the stomach does not have the motility like the esophagus does. Mm -hmm. So you wanna make sure that it is, if you make a really long colus gastroplasty, then the patients are pretty symptomatic uh, with dysphagia if you are doing a full nissen around that. So it's just something to think of. I try to not do mine longer than just a couple centimeters. So mm -hmm. just watch that. Excellent, thank you. So Mike, you're having close uh, trouble closing the hiatus. What are your options? Just tell me everything you could do in the OR. So first I will um, assess the size of that defect. Um, you're, and, you're having and, trouble closing. Tell me all the maneuvers uh, you can so do. I, I, I would start by doing, a, I could do, a, I'll, I'll do a crew release by making a relaxing incision on the, on the is, crew. Is that your first move? My first move would be to put as many stitches as I can, see how I can reduce the size of the defect. Okay. So it's, it's as small as, as I can. Um, if that doesn't work, then I will. Well, I guess we have a lot more. Yeah, so here are some of the things that they mentioned. So make sure you take down all the adhesions to the liver and the spleen to allow the diaphragm to move. You can use mattress sutures or pledges just to better tolerate the tension, especially if the crew are not that strong. You can decrease the insufflation of the new peritoneum from 15 to 10, and maybe that'll help a little bit. Uh, you can consider putting anterior sutures instead of all posterior, since anteriorly you can uh, have less tension. You can induce a left pneumothorax. Some people don't like this option uh, because it's just a temporary effect, and once the cabinothorax goes away, then, then you have a lot of tension. You could use mesh or you can use relaxing incisions as, as you mentioned. So just a quick comment on mesh. I think there's consensus that a prosthetic mesh, it's a big no-no around the esophagus. But there's some data on biological meshes. So there was this randomized controlled trial published in 2006, four centers randomized 108 patients to either primary repair or they use a, a small intestinal submucosa as a biological mesh in a U-shaped form uh, to cover the crura and around the esophagus. And then they followed up these six patients, uh, these patients at six months, and they found, oh my God, the biological mesh is great. There is a big reduction in, in uh, hernia recurrence uh, at six months from 24 to 9%. But then when they did and published the uh, five-year follow-up, they found that the recurrence rate was about the same. So using biological mesh does help in the short term and it can help you get the um, uh, hiatus closed, but uh, you should expect uh, the same long-term results in terms of hernia recurrence. So Luis, you yes. can use um, a, a prosthetic mesh. You should, should just not place it right next to the esophagus. So if you use a relaxing incision and then place the prosthetic mesh in that relaxing incision away, far away from the hiatus, you can get away with it because you don't have prosthetic mesh right at the esophagus. Absolutely yeah. right, Dr. And Mara. you need to use that uh, mesh when you yeah. do the relaxing incision on that area where you did the relaxing incision. One technical thing about closing the diaphragm hiatus is that your life is much easier if you didn't strip all the peritoneum off the diaphragmatic crease while you were doing your mobilization. So it, it really starts to fall apart if it's just a, uh, you know exposed muscle fibers. Right. So that brings me to the next slide. Uh, this uh, paper, a little old, but it describes the use of relaxing incisions. And as you all mentioned, those defects are then repaired, at least in this paper, with a one millimeter PTFE. So in this paper, most uh, prefer was right-sided relaxing incisions. We can show there, this is the right cruise here. This is the uh, line where they do the relaxing incision. This is IVC here. This is where they think the um, thoracic duct, the, the, yeah, the thoracic duct starts. And then there is, this is a, a anterior crural vein where they stop the, the dissection. That's on the right side. On the left side, they recommend moving a little more lateral and making sure you mobilize the entire um, left diaphragm. So just to uh, show 
so in this case, there's a big hole there. They're trying to put stitches. They put the first stitch and then they realize it doesn't work. There's a lot of tension. So and then they go ahead and do a right relaxing incision, making sure you leave a good cuff of tissue on the right crura and uh, being careful with the IVC and also leaving a little bit of cuff on the IVC side so that then you can uh, open that area and then you can repair that um, after you close the hiatus with a PTFE mesh. They're showing where is the usual place for a left-sided relaxing incision. And then here, as we all mentioned, putting the one millimeter PTFE just to close that hole to prevent a diaphragmatic hernia. So in this paper of uh, 15 patients, three patients in the first post-op visit had a, a uh, pleural effusion, but only to require drainage with a pigtail catheter. One patient had a long-term mild elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. And even though the follow-up was short, they described that they had no diaphragmatic hernias and no PTFE mesh infections. So just another thing to keep in mind. So Mike, how do you manage this patient post-op after surgery quickly? Post-operatively start, um, um, I keep MPO of the first post-op day zero and on post-op day one, I will initiate it. How do you follow this patient over time? Um, I'll see them in my clinic for initial post-op visit in about four weeks. Uh, and then after that, I will uh, see them six months and then and annually for maybe like three years. A very quick scenario is Mike. short answer. So you're about to do a parasophageal hernia. You do an EGD. You see three centimeters of circumferential salmon color mucosa above the sea line, what do you do? I'm concerned that there is a uh, presence of various esophagus, of esophagus here. And I, will, I will attempt, I will <clears throat> biopsy that, and uh, I'll get four quadrant biopsies. And um, just due to my concern, I, I think I would, and this is just me, I'll chicken out, I would, I would probably prefer to get in the result of that biopsy before proceeding mm -hmm. to, Completely elective surgery. Okay, so a 45-year-old male with diabetes, sleep apnea, and a BMI of 40 comes in with a type 3 presophageal hernia. What are your options for management, just broadly? Because it's <clears throat> so um, this is an obese patient. I, I would strongly recommend a bariatric uh, um, surgical intervention first to to. Um, Loose, or I would, I, would, I would advise him to lose weight, and then if that doesn't work, then bariatric surgery um, before doing this repair electively. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to have the bariatric surgeon just at least comment and opine on what other options uh, for weight loss um, combined with the first of a general repair. Exam. You want to try to avoid that patient, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're going to recur. It, it, I think that the main solution for that patient is a, a you know, weight loss surgery. Exactly. And then uh, options after uh, failed previous repairs. Um, <coughs> the, what was the approach for the previous repair? Just lap. And now there's symptomatic. Uh, so the one option would be to attempt another laparoscopic. If and my concern would be the presence of adhesion. Uh, and if that's not possible, I'll do a transthoracic approach. Like a thoracic abdominal, you mean? Thoracic abdominal, correct. Or, or transthoracic. Okay. So just, uh, this is a paper that uh, we need to uh, read and look at. It just outcomes on 275 patients after previously failed anti-reflux surgery. I'm just going to move quickly through here, but just uh, uh, remember a lot of this hernia just recurring migrating to the um, uh, chest and then uh, the room why esophagus genostomy is an option, just then redoing the whole thing. Um, all right. Yeah, I would definitely know that that's an option after several recurrences that you need to think about doing a Roux and Y. Correct. All right, so we're reaching... Before an esophagectomy. Correct. The acute scenarios that Dr. Matisse was mentioning before. So Mike, this patient comes to the ED, 76 years old, chest pain, nausea, cannot vomit, has that chest x-ray, uh, has no fever, mild tachycardia. You put a nasogastric tube and the symptoms improve. What do you do now? I'll do an EGD just to evaluate the mucosa of the stomach and rule out any signs of ischemia or necrosis. Um, okay, and, the stomach looks normal. 
If someone looks normal, I can I would, uh, resuscitate and stabilize the patient um, one or two days in the hospital and then plan for same admission repair with parasitic urinary. Great. What about if there's a low grade fever, tachycardia, and you cannot pass an nasogastric tube and the patient's still having symptoms? Um, and then I'm concerned with the presence of fever, tachycardia, and there, that there are signs of necrosis or strangulation. Um, I'll proceed to the operator for, for, for our right. repair. Can you elaborate a little more? Maybe Dr. Matisse will ask you a few questions. Um, yeah, so here's where I, I would, I would, I would initially uh, laparoscopically evaluate, but I have a low threshold for doing an open um, repair, uh, open, sorry, uh, op open perisophageal um, hernia reduction and, and possible gastrectomy, depending on if there's necrosis. If there is necrosis, I would do a gastrectomy and a reconstruction. Um, I would like, I would, I would stay away from doing a wrap the 76 year old male and uh, do a pexy if there's no signs of necrosis. Any comments from the attendings on these acute situations? Yeah, I would agree. I would, you know, one thing to really watch for is sometimes they feel a little bit better if you pass an NG, but if your chest x ray doesn't show, change when you still have that huge air in the stomach, then yeah. they're not decompressed. They need to go. So, okay. You know, looking at that picture, that patient needs to go. Okay. Um, but and and unable to pass an NG is is a very um, you know significant sign that you need to operate emergently on these patients. I think you'll never be hurt by operating sooner rather than later on these patients. From a surgical standpoint, if you have someone very sick and you need to get in and out, just reduce the problem and stick a G tube in. Yeah. It's not the ideal operation, but it it gets you in and out quickly. Okay. I would say the other thing about necrosis and wanting to get in and out very quickly is that you can just divide the esophagus at the GE junction. Be certain that you've pulled your NG tube back, of course, uh, and uh, resect the necrotic part of the stomach, put a G tube in it. And if you fix the, the esophagus so you know where it is, then you have the option of coming back at a later date and reconnecting them. And you can do that, you know, very quickly. Uh, as a way out of somebody who's really sick, who's got a necrotic uh, stomach or esophagus. A couple of long zero proleans at the end of the esophagus help you find it when you go back in. And what if we have to, we have to resect the entire stomach? You're looking at a more advanced reconstruction, like esophageal digenostomy. If, the, if this is a 76 year old or older male, uh, what, at that point, what do you do? Just you proceed with that, or you come back another day? To if you're resecting the entire stomach because of necrosis, they're probably not stable enough for anastomosis. So I yeah. would, res you know, just leave them in discontinuity, resuscitate them, and bring them back when they're more stable, not acidotic. Except you'll usually see some of the antrum will still be alive. Um, but you don't want to make the mistake of, of leaving excluded antrum. That creates a whole new set of problems. So you do need to resect the stomach, even if typically the antrum still looks viable. All right. I think we reached the time. Thank you very much. I hope we reviewed a little bit of everything. Uh, thank you for the discussion. Stay well. Uh, thank th you. Thanks, everyone. You did a great job. Again. Great job. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Well done.